Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, you know, today I just wanted to talk a little bit about those old covenant foreigners who joined themselves or who were allowed to join to the covenant, to the old covenant of Israel. And we read a lot about that in the Old Testament. I wouldn't say a lot, but we do have some portions where uh, God is outlining and instru instructing the Israelites as to how they were to handle uh, a foreigner or a slave or whatever the case may be, right? A person or a character in the story, okay? Now, it's important to always remember what the story is about, first and foremost, and try to not lose sight of that, that being the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? If you lose sight of that, again, when you come to these things like foreigners and whatnot, you're going to be swept away in endless speculation and wondering and thinking that it means something that it doesn't. Um, and that's a pretty common theme in the anti-IO camp, um, especially in regards to the foreigners in the Old Covenant, uh, or foreigners who joined themselves to the Old Covenant, I should say. Um, they were uh, certainly, or they are certainly fixated on that, um, thinking that it, it, you know, means something in, in regards to the New Testament salvation story. Um and obviously, I'm here to tell you that it really doesn't mean anything, and there's a couple of reasons why. Um, but there was one guy in particular, or there is one guy in particular, who uh, likes to kind of spam comments and argue, and I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to, you know, do that to him, but uh, I'm sure many of you have in engaged with him in the past. He used to be IO for a few years. In fact, he used to share a lot of good things about IO and was very excited about IO, but then apparently something happened where the reality of it kind of set in and because he cannot get his mind out from the Bible and out, out of that Bible story, he is stuck. And so being stuck and being a little scared of its implications, he's gone back. And we've seen this with a few guys uh, in the IO movement, actually, you know, probably about a half a dozen that I can think of right now off the top of my head, him being one of them. But they go and they and they become a voice for IO, right? They become a, a strong voice. They're sure of it. They're positive. They're sharing videos and teachings and calling people out and whatnot. And then suddenly, you know, one, two, three years down the line, something happens. They go kind of, you know, bat poop crazy, and uh, they go back, right? And and usually, kind of like Jesus's parable, you know, a, a dog returns to its vomit or something like that. They go back and they become. Uh, tenfold the mess, right? It's just it's just messy because now they've got this, you know, knowledge of preterism and the fulfilled viewpoint, which is clearly the truth. There's no getting around that. Uh, but they have that knowledge, and you know they they all they also have the knowledge of Israel only because they've seen that, uh, and so they're left with this, you know, internal battle, if you will, or you know back and forth on what's right, what's wrong, how does it work, how do we fit in, you know, and it gets really sloppy at that point because you're trying to kind of mend everything and, and, you know, mix everything up together that you know and formulate a new doctrine. And um, I can tell you that a few of the guys that have left have become nothing but a ball of confusion. Um, and I say that as respectfully as possible, but it is ugly. Um but anyways, this one guy uh, had been debating a little bit or arguing on my one of my recent videos, the one about 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And, you know, he's, of course, convinced that, you know, he's God's gift to anybody who wants to learn about the Bible, when in reality, he's more like the big ogre guy from the Goonies in the Bible, the guy with that, you know, ham-shaped head with the eyes bulging out. It's, it's more like that. Um, but it's just ugly, right? It's just messy. Um, but he was arguing and he, he texts me cause he has my number from when he used to be IO and sometimes he'll just continue to text me all day and I won't respond half the time. But when I do, we get into a bit of a back and forth. Um, but one of the things that he texted me, let's see, see if I can find it. Um, here we go. Now he, uh, uh you know, obviously operates on Facebook in numerous different profile accounts He's in a in the world of preterism group, and uh, he sent me a screenshot of a post that he made, and he played it off as if he didn't know who made the post, but clearly it was him. And his question to me was, "What would you tell this poor soul 
about his question. And in the world of preterism, the screenshot is of him. It says anonymous member, but clearly it's him. And it says, I.O., how can you say no Gentiles could be put under the law or that they didn't know about circumcision? Jason DaCosta is wrong on that. And then he quotes a verse from Exodus, which I will quote in a moment. But just to kind of touch on that, uh, first of all, I.O.s don't say that foreigners couldn't join the covenant. Foreigners couldn't be part of the covenant. I mean, that's that's a straw man. That's just not true, right? Uh, I.O.s clearly know that uh, Israelites allowed foreigners to join the covenant for there's uh, numerous passages on that in the Old Testament. Okay, so, and, and all of us have acknowledged that. So I don't understand why, you know, they continuously use that as like, it, as if it's some sort of, you know, uh, argument or point that defeats us like like we were unaware unaware of that point uh no <laughs> we're very aware of that point um he says that i that io says that they didn't that gentiles didn't know about circumcision of course of course and i stand on that and i stand on the, in that in the sense that far and wide for the most part pagan nations had no real understanding of this religion, this concept, right? It wasn't, it was nowhere near as understood and, uh, and accepted and talked about and in, in ingrained as it was with the Israelites because it was their law. It was their requirement, their sign of the covenant, right? The sign of circumcision. So Jerry, oh, I just gave you his name. We'll go back. We'll call him the anonymous member. <laughs> so the anonymous member here, is basically accusing IOers of saying that you know all all Gentiles didn't know about circumcision. Well, that's false. That's not a, that's another straw man argument. We don't say that. Of course, we know that there were some foreigners that were in Israel's old covenant, and of course, we know that they would know about circumcision. Right? That's that's obvious. To even make this argument is silly. It's ridiculous. So he says Jason DeCasa is wrong on that. No, I'm not wrong on that. I know that certain foreigners joined the covenant, but you're acting as if it was by and large the majority of foreigners in the nations. You're crazy. It was an incredibly low, low percentage of foreigners that joined the covenant. Incredibly low. Like we're talking 0.0000005% if you're lucky. So for the most part, 99.9999999% of foreigners were at the very least very unaware or very um, rookie-esque, I guess you could say, in terms of knowing much, if anything, about circumcision. Okay, it was Israel's law, it was Israel's contract, it was their requirement, nobody else's. Okay, so this anonymous member posts this passage from Exodus and says, in Exodus 12, verse 48 and 49, and when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Okay, so he quotes this and, you know, of course he's thinking in his mind, because he has the me, me, me mindset of the New Testament, he's thinking that somehow, some way, a foreigner joining Israel's old ancient covenant, the first covenant that they had, the Law of Moses covenant, somehow a foreigner joining that covenant and becoming circumcised means something for him and others today, right? That's that's the, the leap, right? They say, well, look, you know, God allowed foreigners in in the Old Testament, and clearly he's allowing foreigners in in the New Testament or in today's day and age, which is what he has to think he is, is a foreigner, uh, because that's where he lumps himself in and he uses passages like this to sort of glean his hope from. Um, but in reality, these passages are not really saying anything of the sort, or they don't have anything to do with you you or anybody today. Okay, Whenever we come to something in the Old Testament like this about foreigners joining the covenant, we have to understand it in light of the story. This is a side detail. Okay, This is not something to be stared at or looked at with a microscope. Like, holy cow, look at how he, he treated the foreigners here. This is relative to us today in 2024. No, not at all. Okay, The foreigners joining the covenant was a side detail and nothing more. 
the story is still 100% Israel only. It's focused on Israel only. It's about Israel, Israel's protection from their God, their restoration from their God, their judgment from their God, their punishment from their God, the law from their God, the curse from their God, God restoring them to the city from their God, God giving them all they need from their God, having food and wine and abundance provided from their God, defeating all their enemies from their God, you get the point, right? This is 100%, if we're just talking Old Testament right now, uh, this is all about God blessing Israel. They were the chosen seed. They were the promised ones. They were the, the children of the promise. Okay? So, you have to recognize that and understand that that's what's important. That's what's focused on. That's what you need to really be focused on when you're reading these things. Right? There's a main character in every story, right? You go to the movies, you watch a movie with The Rock in it, all right? You're going to have probably a 90-minute movie and, and 75 of those minutes is going to be The Rock, okay? Because he's the main character. He's the one they want you to focus on. He's who you pay to go see, right? And there's going to be side characters. You're going to have some, some cast members who have a lesser role. Maybe one appears for five minutes, one appears for two minutes, Somebody just makes a quick appearance in a, in a pizza shop and walks out. It makes a few hundred bucks for the appearance. You're going to have these little side characters because you can't have the story without them. You need them, right? Well, that's how the foreigners joining the Old Covenant must be looked at. These are side characters, okay? What's important, folks? Well, Abraham is important, okay? That's where it starts, Okay. In my opinion, the first fathers of Israel, those old ancient legends, the, the Adams, the Noahs, I don't think they mean much, to be honest. I really don't. Um, I think Abraham is incredibly important. Okay, That's where it starts. The promise in Genesis 17 given to Abraham that through his descendants, many nations would be blessed is huge. Right? That's where it all begins. Through Isaac, your seed shall be called, right? Abraham had many children, but the, the chosen line, the promised children, the seed of promise, the children of promise, these are all things that they're called, they came through Isaac and they came through Jacob and they were the 12 tribes of Israel and her descendants after them. That's all the story talks about. It doesn't get into detail. It doesn't talk about how they you know, got where they got or how that works biologically or, or the DNA or anything. No, it just says that. Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob produced the 12 tribes and the 12 tribes had their descendants. That's it. This is a family affair. Okay. So not all who came from Abraham were of the seed. They weren't, right? You have the two covenants, Paul talks about. There's a lot of symbolism there. But I think Abraham is what you really need to focus on because that's where the promise is made about this chosen seed, this, this special people. And of course, we know as we get through the, the tales of, uh, you know, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come to Jacob. Jacob lays his hand on Joseph's uh, two sons' heads. We know the promise was that Ephraim would become pushed out into the nations and become a great multitude of nations. Manasseh would be great as well, but Ephraim would be massive. And so we have these promises started from the beginning. And then obviously we have, you know, the 12 tribes and their story. And we have the, you know, the dividing and the conquerings and all this history about Israel. And through that history comes the joining of the foreigner to the old covenant, right? In passing, in detail, in passing detail, I should say, we have you know, instances of a foreigner joining the covenant. Males being circumcised or male foreigners being circumcised because if they weren't, they couldn't eat. That's how important circumcision was to that covenant contract. It was literally the sign of the covenant. Hence why Paul talks about it so much. But my point here is that we need to understand that the promise came, like Paul said, 400 years before Sinai, before the law. So anything that occurred after that promise was irrelevant to the promise. 
Let me say that again so you can understand. Anything that you see taking place in terms of adding on or subtracting from that promise, or it's irrelevant to the promise, right? That promise was set in stone. Paul says one cannot annul that promise, which came 400 years before Sinai. And what was the promise? It was, again, that Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, to the 12 tribes of Israel would be blessed. And many nations would be blessed through this descendant line. And that's all we see, isn't it, in the promises in the Old Testament. We see God promising literally to bless Israel. That's it. It's just, I will bless you, Israel. You are my chosen, Israel. I love you, Israel. You are the apple of my eye, Israel. I will give you all you need, Israel. I will fight your battles, Israel. I will hand your enemies over to you, Israel. I will rebuild your cities, Israel. I will make your oil and wine and vats full, Israel. I will, you know, pile up the grain in your threshing field. <laughs> all this crap, right? That's all it is, is, is Israel being blessed. Because that was the promise. And that's who it, who it came to. Again, Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the 12 tribes and their descendants. So the point is, whenever we see a foreigner joined in the covenant or joined to the covenant in the, in the meat of the story, we can't let that override the promise that came before okay and this is why all anytime one of these wannabes bring this up i kind of chuckle and wonder if they're even on the same planet because it really has no bearing on the io viewpoint right io came from abraham the promise about israel and israel being the you know the promised seed the seed of promise the children of promise came at abraham well before any foreigner joined Israel's covenant. So again, Israel's people joining Israel's covenant or foreigners joining Israel's covenant should be looked at uh, in a very side detail type of way. It certainly shouldn't be looked at as something that you think defeats I.O., right? Again, because I.O. starts at Abraham. The promise came at Abraham, okay? So any details that come about later on in the story do not negate or sway, or affect that promise. Okay, that was set in stone, according to the story. So that's number one. Case closed, game over, there's no arguments. Okay. The second argument, or the second reason why it's irrelevant, is because the story ended. The New Testament salvation ended at the coming of the Lord, which was the resurrection of the dead. And that was in their, their lifetime. It was coming soon upon them. It was They were in the last days. So that whole story wrapped up. This news of the kingdom of the gospel would go to all nations and then the end would come, said Jesus. So that story ended. That's what the New Testament shows. So there's no covenant to join to because they were all raptured out just like Christ ascended up into heaven and they were taken to their new Jerusalem. That's the end of the story. It's the grand taking away where there would be no more pain, tears, or death. So what covenant covenant are you joining to today? Now, I know there's some loonies out there that say it's a spiritual kingdom, spiritual covenant. You got to understand it, yada, yada, yada. But the story doesn't allow you to, to have that belief. You have that belief because you want it, not because the story warrants it. The story takes them out of this realm. Flesh and blood could not inherit the kingdom of God, so they needed to be changed to immortal. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15 shows. So there's no if, ands, buts about it. There is no covenant to join today. The new covenant was made for the house of Israel and the house of Judah, a.k.a. all Israel, and they were all saved, which included the fullness of the nations. So that happened, and there is no covenant to join today. So again, those Old Testament foreigners that joined the covenant, A, they have no relation or no sway on the story because the promise came at Abraham well before them, and it was exclusive to Israel, Abraham's descendants, the chosen ones through Isaac and Jacob. And B, because there is no covenant today to join to, because according to the New Testament, that ended and they were taken to a pie in the sky. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it, folks. If you did, give it a like, a ruski. If not, take a hike, a ruski, and we'll catch you on that flip side. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.